like the model t ford which put america on wheels the c forty seven gave the g i his wings that was our airplane and all i can tell you is that there was never a better workhorse very plain very plain but it turned out to be a, a terrific instrument of war an instrument that was destined to play the lead in some of the most crucial and the most dangerous missions of World War II. Paratroops, airborne forces, and freight, they're all part of the job for the Dakota. Developed from the famous American peacetime airliner, the Douglas DC-3, she's now in extensive use with the British and American forces. It was agreed that the C-47 should become the standard transport aircraft for the Allies. Soon, its outline became familiar in every theater of the war. It's hard to overstate the importance of the transport aircraft in the Second World War. It towed gliders. It flew in bullets and bayonets and blankets. It reached out to remote airstrips, sometimes where there was no road. It enabled armies to be effectively supported in the field, probably for the first time in history. All of this accomplished by an undramatic flying truck. To the British, it was the Dakota. To the Americans, it was the C-47 Goonie Bird but it had plenty of unofficial names as well. I named my aircraft Y, W-H-Y question mark. Why do we have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning? Why do we have to haul gasoline? Why do we have to fly through all types of weather? But you just carry out the mission. It was just a flying truck. Anything that had to be hauled to get to where it was destined to go in a hurry, the C-47 did it. It's a good and well-designed airplane, and structurally, it is very, very strong. The flexibility of the wings is such that it creates very little stress when you're flying with a heavy load. And it gives you the maneuverability and the feeling of safety. The unarmed C-47 transport became the most versatile aircraft of the war, with a growing reputation for reliability on the battlefield. It was the ship that would get you home. As it mastered each new task, the missions became more demanding and more dangerous. Its side door made it the ideal aircraft for parachute drops. It dropped stores and equipment, providing a lifeline for isolated forces, like the British troops fighting deep in the jungles of Burma. And it dropped men, the elite paratroop units that played a key role in the Allied invasions from North Africa to Normandy. When America entered the war, two airborne divisions were formed, the 82nd, known as the All-American, and the 101st, or Screaming Eagles. When combined with the C-47 transports of the 9th Troop Carrier Command, they quickly established a reputation as an elite force. Well, the first time that I ever saw a paratrooper with his parachute wings and his polished boots, uh, I just knew that that was for me. I always wanted to be an army officer. I always wanted to lead men in combat. And I knew right away I wanted to go to jump school. I'm Jewish, and I had a vendetta to fight. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I, I would say at least 50%, uh, 60%, the men are weeded out. You must be in extremely good physical condition. You go through seven days and all it is is physical running and drill and push-ups and exercise, rope climbing, 
and uh, a lot of the people can't do it. And they're, they're out on day one, and they just don't want to do it because they don't have the mental aggressiveness that I want to be a paratrooper. The C-47 became an indispensable part of the airborne operation. The paratroopers adopted it enthusiastically. The former airliner was proving to be as tough as they were. It was exciting. It's a very exciting thing to be with men to jump at an airplane. 